Good afternoon and welcome to the third in PPMD's series of four cardiac webinars. My name is Kathy Kennan. I'm Vice President of Clinical Care and I'll be hosting today. Before we get started, I'd like to address just a few housekeeping issues. First, this webinar is scheduled for one hour as we have several speakers and I anticipate there might be many questions. We might run slightly longer. Please keep in mind that only the presenters are mic'd. The audience is muted and can ask questions by typing into the chat box. We will do our best to answer all of your questions. However, if due to time constraints we don't get to some of the questions, all the answers and questions can be found on the PPMD website. Our focus of today's webinar is the use of ventricular assist devices in patients with Duchenne. We are honored to have as guest speakers four very distinguished cardi cardiothoracic surgeons from around the United States. First, Dr. Robert Jaquist is a professor of surgery and pediatrics and chief of pediatric cardiac surgery at Duke University Medical Center. Along with his interest in congenital cardiac surgery, Dr. Jaquist has a long-standing professional focus on cardiac transplantation and mechanical circulatory support in infants, children, teenagers, and young adults. Dr. Patrick McConnell is an assistant professor of surgery at the Wexner Medical Center at the U United, I'm sorry, the Ohio State University and is attending surgeon and director of the Mechanical Cardiopulmonary Support Program at Nationwide Children's Hospital in Columbus, Ohio. His practice is confined to adult pediatric and neonatal congenital heart surgery with a special focus on valve surgery and mechanical support technology. Dr. McConnell conducts basic science and translational research investigating the impact of mechanical support on cardiac function and recovery. He also receives funding to investigate novel device-based strategies for heart failure treatment and valve repair techniques. Dr. Cruz Agasati is a professor of surgery and pediatrics at Washington University in St. Louis, where he serves as chief of pediatric cardiothoracic surgery and co-director of the Heart Center at St. Louis Children's Hospital. He was surgical director of the transplant program at Cincinnati Children's for six years and then the director of cardiothoracic surgeon in Cincinnati for one year prior to leaving for Cincinnati for Cardinals land. He's been funded by the NIH for the last seven years and has a strong interest and passion for quality improvement and outcomes research, which he continues in St. Louis. Dr. David Morales is a surgeon in chief of cardiothoracic surgery at Cincinnati Children's Hospital Medical Center. Dr. Morales has an academic appointment as professor of pediatrics and surgery and is the Clark Helmsworth Endowed Chair of Pediatric Cardiothoracic Surgery at the University of Cincinnati College of Medicine. He also serves as the executive co-director for the Heart Institute at Cincinnati Children's Hospital Medical Center. Dr. Morales' current areas of investigation include development and use of pediatric ventricular assist devices, tissue engineering, and linkage of national cardiovascular databases to national registries. His areas of clinical interest include cardiac surgery for heterotaxy syndrome, pediatric heart failure, including mechanical circulatory support and transplantation, and reconstruction of the trachea and bronchi in children. Quite distinguished guests we have. We will begin the webinar with Dr. Jaquist, who will be describing ventricular assist devices and when they might be considered. Dr. Jaquist? Thank you, Kathy. Um, I appreciate very much the opportunity to uh, uh, be on the webinar today and, and look forward to uh, uh, a productive uh, a discussion and, and hearing from my uh, distinguished colleagues as well. So I'm going to start uh, this afternoon talking about some very basic uh, things like what is a VAD or an LVAD uh, and then move into when you might use one and then, uh, and then my uh, colleagues will uh, get down into the nitty-gritty details. So what is a, a VAD or an LVAD? And a VAD or an LVAD uh, is a ventricular assist device, uh, which is very simply a pump that is used to replace or augment the function of one or both ventricles of the heart uh, when that, that function has fallen below some threshold level. And VADs can be subtyped uh, descriptively based on which ventricles they are supporting. So by convention, an LVAD is that which supports the left ventricle or the pump that supplies blood to the body. An RVAD is a, a similar type pump which is supporting the right ventricle that pumps blood to the lungs. And then a BIVAD configuration, which is relatively unusual, supports both the right ventricle and the left ventricle and is made up of two pumps. I want to talk a little bit just for review about normal cardiovascular function so that we can get a sense of context about when and how VADs might be used. So normally the cardiovascular system is designed to deliver oxygen to the body at a rate that allows normal activity and then at times of 
need for increased activity, the cardiovascular system should be able to provide excess oxygen at times of stress or increased uh, exercise and the like. If the delivery rate falls because the pump begins to fail, then the body accounts for that by reducing its activity level as, as low as it can uh, so that there is not a deficit between the oxygen that is required and the oxygen that can be delivered. Ultimately, however, if the pump continues to fail, then basal metabolism fails, which leads to a state of shock or uh, what we call in the, in the clinical realm low cardiac output syndrome. The system that is, is set up to provide this, uh, which is a normal circulation, is in physics terms described as a series circulation, so that blood flows from point A to point B to point C to point D and back to point A. So in cardiac terms, it flows from the right side of the heart to the lungs, back to the left side of the heart, and then on out to the body. And in general, because the right side of the heart doesn't pump blood very far, it pumps under low pressures, the left side of the heart pumps all the way from the top of our head to the tips of our toes, pumps over a greater distance at higher pressures. Flow is unidirectional, that it flows forward and not backwards. This requires the presence of valves in the circuit, and these valves have to be unobstructed like doorways that can open completely. The next several slides are very similar to this one, which are di diagrammatic representations of what I've just described. So to take us through the, the strategy here, we can start with blood, which is in the body that has had its oxygen removed by the body and to which carbon dioxide, a normal product of metabolism, has been added. This blood turns blue because of the relative deficiency of oxygen and is returned through a series of veins to the right atrium of the heart down through a valve into the right-sided pumping chamber called the right ventricle, and that blue blood is then delivered to the lungs where oxygen is added and carbon dioxide is removed, and as a result of addition of oxygen, the blood turns bright red. It then returns through veins from the lung to the left side of the heart, to the left atrium, down through a valve into the left ventricle, uh, and then the left ventricle pumps the blood out to the body, and the whole thing starts again, and this is how things should normally work. If the left ventricle begins to fail, which I will highlight in this and subsequent slides as one of those circles with a bar across it, like we don't want this to happen, what happens is that the left ventricle initially enlarges, and the valve between the left ventricle and the left atrium, which in this diagram is a small triangle, this is the mitral valve of the heart, begins to leak very often. As the left ventricle worsens in its failure and the mitral valve begins to leak more, the left atrium begins to enlarge and back pressure is exerted on the circulation of blood in the lungs. An immediate consequence of this is that fluid begins to build up in the lungs, fluid called pulmonary edema, and this can result in shortness of breath or difficulty breathing or at least diminished exercise capacity. This is a, a, a system or a problem that can be ongoing and as it gets worse and worse, the left atrium, the mitral valve, and most importantly, perhaps in terms of symptoms, the lungs uh, really begin to uh, show the, the bad effects of this failing left ventricle. This backup phenomenon can continue so that eventually the, what's going on in the left ventricle, which has affected the left atrium, which has affected the lungs, can begin to back up and affect the right ventricle, the right atrium, and the body itself. And as this whole process proceeds, the accumulation of fluid, which has happened in the lungs, is also mirrored in the body, and swelling uh, can begin to appear in the feet particularly, but all over the body, uh, and eventually the organs of the body begin to fail, most importantly perhaps the lungs and the kidneys, so that the removal of excess fluid, which is causing symptoms, uh, becomes more and more difficult. If this process isn't, isn't stopped, uh, this course eventually uh, is fatal. So one of the ways that this can be stopped, which is what's got us talking today, is the insertion of something called a left ventricular assist device or an LVAD pump. And I've shown that in this diagram as a circle with a red or with a black X in it, uh, highlighted as an LVAD pump. And what's demonstrated here is that we use such a pump to withdraw blood from the left side of the heart, the failing side, provide uh, power to that blood and pump it downstream into the artery to the body called the aorta. And by inserting such a pump, we can see a reversal of the process that I've just outlined. Certainly we see uh, much less back pressure in the lungs and very frequently the resolution of the accumulation of fluid in the lungs, which we can see as, as an abnormal x-ray, but most importantly the patient may experience as difficulty breathing. 
In some circumstances, if the heart failure is particularly advanced and the right side of the heart has also been particularly impacted in a negative way, we even put in a pump to support the right side of the heart, and this is the bivad configuration that I described earlier. This is a very unusual circumstance in isolated left ventricular failure, uh, as is typically seen in, in the type of heart failure with, associated with cardiomyopathy. But just for completeness, I've included it here. For those of you who are not familiar with ventricular assist devices, although I've drawn it this way, this is not what a VAD looks like. This is an old-fashioned VAD, although it still finds some application, particularly in adults. This is a Thoratec device, which has a pump, in, as shown in the diagram on the left, attached to both the right side of the heart with a second pump attached to the left side of the heart. And the whole business is controlled by a very large machine that sits at the end of the bed about the size of an ATM. Fortunately for uh, patients uh, with heart failure requiring a VAD, the science has advanced significantly so that this is a much more commonly seen VAD now. And, and for size purposes, you can see the surgeon's glove, gloved hand holding uh, this type of VAD, which is a HeartMate II. And as opposed to the device that I just showed you on the previous slide, this can be almost entirely implanted inside the body with only a small power cable coming through the skin, the white thing in the lower left-hand corner of the slide. These devices are vast improvements over the devices which we had in former generations, both in terms of their ease of control, the size of the devices, the complications that are associated, uh, and have really been a great leap forward. But as with many things in medicine, progress hasn't stopped. This is probably the newest player on the block. This is the uh, so-called hardware device, recently uh, more fully approved by the FDA. Like the HeartMate 2, which I just showed, uh, this device is implantable entirely except for a small power cable that comes through the skin. But as opposed to the HeartMate 2, which is a significantly larger device, this can be implanted entirely in the chest above the level of the diaphragm. So we are getting better and better and better with these devices. They're getting smaller and much less onerous to put in and, more importantly, much less onerous to live with. What does a patient look like who's got a VAD in? Well, I randomly selected a fairly famous patient that many of you may be familiar with who had a HeartMate 2 in for quite a period of time. Uh, this uh, uh, fellow here, um, our old, old vice president, who has subsequently gone on and gotten a heart transplant. Uh, I, I think uh, one of the most surprising things to many of us in the field who didn't care for this man was that he had a heart at all, but I'll, I'll leave the politics aside for the moment. So with that, I'm going to step into the second portion of my talk, which is to talk about when we might actually put one of these in. So to review the treatment of heart failure uh, more conventionally, um, it's initially treated with medications, and those medications take several forms. We use diuretics uh, given orally to reduce the extra fluid accumulation in the lungs and the body. We use a class of medications called afterload reduction, which makes the arteries in the body relax so that the failing heart doesn't have to push the blood quite as hard. We can use direct cardiac stimulants, which can make the heart muscle squeeze more efficiently and then other types of medications such as beta blockers which may reduce the overall level of activation of the body and make the heart's job a little bit easier. As the heart failure worsens, these medications which are initially given orally may be necessary to have delivered in a more potent form intravenously, but eventually as the heart failure progresses, even that may not be enough. And when we reach that point, then we begin to think about more advanced uh, treatments. In the extreme case, the most advanced treatment for a failing heart is to simply replace the heart with a transplant. This is a, a commonly applied uh, treatment for severe heart failure, but it has a variety of limitations associated with it. One of the most important of that is that we can't just do a heart transplant. When we, may, we may want to do a heart transplant. The donor availability is both limited in terms of the absolute numbers of donors available, but also, very importantly, we can't call up a donor whenever we want one. In addition, transplant itself, the process, requires patients to take a very complicated cocktail of medications to prevent the transplant recipient from rejecting the organ, which is recognized by the body's immune system, as foreign material in the same way that the body recognizes bacteria and germs. So a transplant, although it's very effective, is not always possible and certainly not always possible in a timely fashion. 
This is critical because, in general, it's fair to say that patients who need heart transplants need them before they're immediately available. And as I've said, the timing is unpredictable, which puts patients and their caregivers in a position of having to keep the patients alive long enough to receive a new heart. And that has introduced the concept of what's called bridge therapy, in that we are bridging patients to keep those with severe heart failure alive long enough that they can receive a heart transplant. And the means that we use for that is something broadly called mechanical circulatory support, and a VAD is simply a type of mechanical circulatory support. And in this context, we describe VAD as being used as a bridge to transplant. There are problems with VADs, as there are with transplants. It requires an open heart operation to implant VADs. VADs are made up of artificial or man-made surfaces which are in contact with blood, and artificial surfaces in contact with blood create the possibility and the, even the likelihood of blood clotting. And some of these clots can either cause the VAD not to work as well or perhaps even more ominously can cause strokes. So to prevent clots or reduce the risk of clots at least, we have to use powerful blood thinners which themselves have the side effect of causing an increased risk of bleeding. In addition, all VADs that are currently available require some sort of cord or blood tube to cross the skin barrier so that this creates at least the potential route of entry for germs, specifically bacteria, to get into the uh, patient's system and cause an infection. In addition, the durability of effective usefulness of a VAD is uncertain. It is possible since these are mechanical devices that they can wear out, and it is certainly true for all VADs that they are very expensive. That said, VADs have been a wonderful addition to the uh, list of tools that we have to treat patients with advanced heart failure. So wonderful that there's been a widespread adoption of their use as a, as a, as a way to get a handle on what that means and how large the usage is and how people are, are finding and faring uh, their experience with, with these type devices. A registry was created known as Intermax, which is a national registry for patients who are receiving VADs that are FDA approved uh, in the use of, of treating heart failure. And the registry has been a wonderful addition and helped us learn a lot of things about VADs. And I'm going to, over the next several slides, uh, share with you today some of the lessons or some of the things that we have learned about VAD usage as a result of this registry. One of the things that we've learned is that not only do VADs work, but that there's a lot of people out there who can benefit from them. And this is the uh, annual enrollment, enrollment for patients into the Intermax registry since it began in 2006. And the data are complete in this slide up through the mid-2012. But I think it's fair to say that this graph, which shows time along the bottom and the number of VADs implanted along the vertical axis, uh, as demonstrating that the community of heart failure physicians uh, and therapists uh, have very avidly adopted uh, this VAD technology and its, its use is continuing to grow. One of the other things that we've learned about VADs is that over time we've become more and more comfortable with how to put VADs in, what the complications might be like, what the side effect profiles are, and so that we are more and more comfortable putting them into people who are perhaps somewhat less ill. To understand patients and define them a little bit better, the VAD uh, registry, Intermax, created seven different, different levels of illness to describe the patients who were receiving VADs. And in this scheme, the patients who were sickest and most at risk of dying immediately were described as Intermax level one. The medical terminology for that is critical cardiogenic shock. The least ill patients in this category are those in, in level seven who have advanced heart failure but are not felt to be at an immediate risk of dying. And in this table shown on the current slide, we can see that in 2006, 41% of patients receiving VADs were in critical cardiogenic shock and another 39% were nearly as ill. As experience with VADs has grown, as we have gotten better VADs and we have seen that the results with VAD implantation are improving, we have now changed that profile substantially so that only 14% of patients in the most recent report were in critical cardiogenic shock, and now nearly 40% are in levels three and four. And this is a reflection of the fact that we are much more comfortable we can put these devices in earlier in the course of the device and that we can expect these patients to do very well for a long period of time. And as we go forward with this registry, I'm certain that we will see a continuing evolution towards earlier and earlier usage with these devices. 
So I've talked a little bit about bridge to transplant. Are there other times when we might use a VAD? And the answer is certainly yes. One of the things that was discovered in treating patients with heart failure is that some of them are probably not good candidates to receive a heart transplant. They may have other medical problems or they may be beyond an age at which people feel it's reasonable to offer transplantation. In addition, there are other subsets of patients, for example, those who may have had cancer treated before in whom the anti-rejection medications might cause a risk of recurrence of the cancer. That doesn't mean the patients don't have heart failure and don't need to be treated. It just means that we can't treat them effectively with a transplant. So what can we offer those patients as they get worse? Well, one of the things that we can offer them is a VAD, even if there's nothing on the other side of the bridge in terms of transplant. And in that case, we call this destination therapy. And this slide here was taken from a very important uh, study that was done to examine this question. It was published in the New England Journal of over 10 years ago now, something called the REMATCH trial. And in this study, what was done was a group of patients who were not candidates for transplantation but did have advanced heart failure were divided into two groups. One group received one of these ventricular assist device pumps, an older generation pump than we use currently, but certainly a very effective device. And they were compared to the other group of patients who were in all other ways identical but simply not receiving a VAD. So they were treated with the best medications, whether oral or intravenous. And what this graph shows is the percentage of patients in both groups that are surviving as time proceeds. And what is clearly demonstrated here is that those with LV assist devices, which is another way of saying VAD, did substantially better at every time point than those patients receiving best medical therapy. So what was concluded from this study correctly was that VADs have a very important role to play in patients who may not be transplant candidates but who have advanced heart failure, and that if we treat patients in that way, we can expect a much larger percentage of them to live a much, a much longer time. So if we look again at the Intermax registry, how has that changed what we do? And this slide here demonstrates why the VADs were put in patients in 2006. Some were bridged with an intent that they would recover, and that occasionally happens if the heart failure is caused by an infection. Many, 44%, were put in as a bridge to transplant. About 35% were put in with hopes that they would become transplant candidates, but only 15% were put in as a destination, that is, they were not ever felt to be transplant candidates. If we compare that to the most recent report, we see now that that has changed dramatically, so that now 34% of patients were bridged, and another 40% are seen as bridge to transplant candidacy, but those that may not ever need a transplant, and only 24% of them were put in as bridge to transplant. So clearly this concept of destination therapy has been enthusiastically adopted by the community, and it is certainly fair to say that VADs are now more commonly used as destination therapy worldwide than they are as bridge to transplant. This is, in fact, a mature and accepted technology. So to conclude, when might a VAD be considered? Well, it's very simple. When heart, sta when heart failure has advanced beyond the ability of conventional, conventional and reasonable medical therapy, medications alone are not enough. It can certainly be used as a bridge to transplant if that's the ultimate intent, but in a quite reasonable way, it can also be used as destination therapy without expecting ever to transplant the patient. Uh, thanks very much, and I'll uh, turn it back over to Kathy for the next speaker. Thanks very much. So Dr. Um, Peruse Gassati is now going to talk to us about who might be considered an appropriate candidate for a VAD. Good afternoon. It's a privilege as well to be speaking to you, and I thank uh, Jay for doing such a nice job um, laying the foundation. And I have to say that I preface that based on what you heard from uh, Jake and also what I'll be presenting, much of what we know, frankly, again, stems from experience that's learned in the in the adult realm. And in fact, in our program, really, we're, we're of a um, multidisciplinary program, and um, much of what we do is based on adults, but we've extrapolated to the pediatric realm. And um, this experience is growing. Uh, on average here, we implant about um, 70 VADs a year, of which only about 10 to 12 of them are um, pediatric. And with regard to destination therapy that um, Dr. Jake was alluded to, um, approximately um, 20 of those patients um, are, again, adults on, on that pathway. And only recently, we had two patients that went down the destination therapy pathway in the pediatric um, uh, children 
and um, it's a process that we're still learning, and we're learning a lot from our adult colleagues. So much of the information I'm sharing with you is, is derived from that. And not often we have this multidisciplinary conference when, when we talk about specific circumstances, and I'm going to focus mostly on long-term support, which is the terminology that's coming to vogue as opposed to destination, if you will, is it really depends. I mean, what is the goal? Is the goal quality of life versus quantity? And I extrapolate by saying it's a situation where a patient has repeated hospital admissions versus the goal is to um, uh, get longevity of life. And ideally, the goal is to accomplish both. And you heard the vernacular, the the, the common terminology we use of bridge, bridge to what? And I'm going to spend just a minute or two related to that because that obviously impacts the decision who's a candidate for what um, pathway. Patient characteristics play an important role in deciding, for example, the body habit is the size. As you'll see, some of these devices, they have different configurations that uh, enter the equation when one is deciding in terms of what operation to do and whether they've had prior surgeries and their diaphragm function, um, and the intended purpose. As you heard from Dr. Jaquis, typically when we talk about VAD, we're referring to use of it on the left side or LVAD, but there can be circumstances and people have reported using them in either isolated right side or in combination, and very rarely has that been done uh, in the destination setting or the long-term support. And then lastly, one of the other key things that um, repeatedly comes up, and this is not frankly novel to this area, and it's, it dovetails with anything we do in surgery, is the associated conditions of the patient, whether they have um, deteriorated renal function, um, they have uh, diabetes or immunosuppression. So with that said, you know, I, I put this figure up here with all the different bridges to sort of give the notion in, 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 in an analogous fashion of what we think of. And to think it through, you can have a situation where bridge to decision. In fact, one of the patients that we bridged with long-term support, it was a child that uh, presented to us in a, a pretty poor condition. And frankly, at the time, we couldn't determine whether the patient would be a candidate for long-term support or whether there would be, a, I'm sorry, a candidate for transplant or long-term support. So the device was used as a bridge to decision. And ultimately, after some time, we were able to uh, make a definitive decision for that patient. Bridge to bridge is a situation where basically we still um, using it as a means of getting to a more definitive form of therapy with another device, perhaps with a more short-term support. Bridge to recovery is an area that um, we still have <clears throat> a lot to learn. There's uh, not as much experience, and the notion is there that perhaps if we provide the device as a means of supporting the patient's circulation and then carrying out other treatments, uh, such as medical therapy or in the pipeline, uh, folks are talking about gene therapy, bone marrow, um, uh, stem cell therapy, then maybe we can change the natural history of the disease and they won't necessarily require the device um, long-term or perhaps <clears throat> to the extent that um, they would require at the time of the original implant. A uh, bridge to transplant is one that you heard a fair amount about and that's where the most experience is. And lastly is bridge to destination. Um, of long-term support, and I, I, I found this image of this bridge in China. I never heard of it, but um, it's the longest uh, bridge existing in the world, and you can see in the shadow that it, it looms into the horizon, and you're not certain where it goes. And in many ways, what we're doing today is uh, on the verge of uh, the same concept where we are still sort of determining the future, and much is, uh, much is still changing. So historically, at the bottom of that figure, you've seen the Far left-hand side is the older device of the, the Thoratec company that was made that was approved for long-term support, followed by uh, approved uh, HeartMate 2, abbreviated as HM2, in the middle of which you've seen the picture of. And then lastly, it was the hardware um, device at the very bottom. And in fact, hardware currently is in a trial called the Endurance Trial, where it's being compared to the HeartMate 2 device. Um, the significant important difference between HeartMate 2 and hardware is the fact that with hardware, as you can see, it completely implants within the uh, pericardial well the heart sits in. While the HeartMate 2 may require, in fact, um, taking down some of the diaphragm for its uh, appropriate positioning. So in terms of ease, it's a lot easier to put the hardware and certainly has attracted a lot of attention by um, surgeons because of ease of implantability. Uh, it's still a lot to be learned. It's not like it's a clear winner, but uh, much is being learned. <clears throat> and you can see, um, while 
um, the, the past certainly um, or present we had certain limitations in the pipeline um, number of companies here are devices that are being developed by um, Thoratech, the developer or the company that sponsors HeartMate 2 and frankly the entrance of new devices is a, is a, is a great thing because it stimulates these companies to invest and develop more advanced technologies that would improve um, on the aspects, various aspects to make this more feasible to be employed for more patients with um, various conditions and situations. And here is another example in the middle. So on the far left-hand side in the, this slide is the variations of the hardware is, in fact, developing. And in the very middle of that is a new device as well that they're developing that um, could be even implanted with minimally invasive approach. And lastly, um, this is a device here, Circulite, which is intended for partial support uh, in an adult, and partial support meaning not um, providing as much flow or as much support as you would see with a typical fully implantable or the devices that I just showed you in those pictures. But the other option with these devices is that in a potentially younger patient, partial support may in fact be a lot more support. So a child who has certain needs may benefit from these new technologies, and so we will be a beneficiary of um, continuing advances in this field. <clears throat> so destination therapy today, certainly um, one of the aspects of it from the financial side, um, Medicare only considers destination therapy for patients who are not eligible for transplant. But um, this is going to be an evolving field as well from a financial aspect, and I know we are not touching on that, but um, because of the rapidly growing field in 2011, at least um, close to 40% of all implants um, in the United States were accounted for by the long-term support needs. And, the and, and we're very quickly realizing that there were certain indications or contraindications to use of these devices in the past um, that may be changed, and those are what I refer to as modifiable factors. And um, there's uh, significant advances in um, technology as well that may enhance on some of the limitations with the current devices. And as I said, the general consensus is becoming that we should, as Puss is talking about, um, destination therapy really refer to as long-term mechanical circulatory support. Indeed, in that context, I should even point out um, for the audience that there is an ongoing trial. Um, you heard um, Dr. Jaquist talk about the various Intermax stages. And historically, um, the trend was originally to use these devices in those in, in extreme conditions, but gradually that sh has shifted with improving uh, experience and outstanding outcomes now approaching 90% survival in one year with these devices. That, in fact, um, there is question whether this should be employed further and further ahead in time and even patients that are, in fact, doing okay on medical therapy or is considered to be doing okay. And the REVIVE trial, which is currently postponed, is um, one such trial where essentially one of the composite endpoints, as I highlight in this slide, includes patients who are ambulatory um, and not necessarily in the most uh, worst condition. And you can, <clears throat> at your leisure, read through all the different components. But one of the key things, in fact, you can see that, it's, that these are subset of patients that are not on inotrope support. So their heart failure is not as advanced. So I think this is going to be an exciting area um, of development, and we will be getting more information, and it's not inconceivable in the future that these devices will be employed sooner and sooner in patients in conjunct conjunction with other medical therapy. So history often repeats itself, and one of the things that I've this, – this slide, again, is meant to um, show all the contraindications for uh, transplantation. And hopefully you'll be able to read, but historically – um, what have been considered based on the, the data gathered from the registries and various institutional experiences is that patients with end organ dysfunction, particularly kidney failure, were often considered not to be uh, transplant candidates or high body mass index, which refers to um, severe obesity. So this slide essentially shows potential modifiable and then non-modifiable. So if you look at the patients that are listed in the adult setting, for a transplant who've ultimately gone on to destination therapy, 38% of our patients that were at advanced age or peripheral vascular disease, which obviously doesn't apply to the pediatric population. But what you do see <clears throat> in there are other things like nutrition, frailty, uh, issues related to um, prior number of surgeries. And 
what we are learning now on this next slide is that many of those same criteria, in fact, are panning out to be also true potentially for consideration who's a candidate for long-term support. This is a recent paper that was published, um, again, <clears throat> from the Interbax um, Registry by Dr. Kirkland and colleagues, looking at <clears throat> evolution and outcomes of um, patients for long-term destination therapy. And in this paper, you can see they had they looked at 1,287 patients, of which a vast majority of them, uh, shown on the right-hand side, were patients who received only on the left ventricular support side. <clears throat> and the key component of that study highlighted on this slide here is, um, is basically risk factors for death in patients who were receiving a device for long-term support is that in particular if they'd had multiple surgeries previously or if they were had pretty advanced kidney disease, for example, requiring dialysis or elevations in one of their kidney profile tests, such as BUN, it was a significant risk factor for death. And then lastly, not surprisingly, if they were in that group that um, Dr. Jaquis alluded to as the very, the very sickest um, receiving the device, they had a very poor outcome. So today in current age, really, as, as the field is evolving, it's not so much who is a candidate, it's more who is not a candidate. And so like in our multidisciplinary conference, what we talk about is um, knowing now that these devices can clearly effectively support patients for up to two years, does the patient's life expectancy in the absence of support um, less than 80% chance of making it to two years? Are they or are they not a transplant candidate? How um, severely ill they are at the time for consideration of placement of the device? Do they have very advanced um, kidney dysfunction? So, for example, um, if the um, uh, one of the measures of kidney function we look at is glomerular filtration rate. If the uh, GFR, uh, as it's abbreviated, if it's less than um, 30 percent, we do not consider them to be good candidates for destination therapy. With regard to immunosuppression, this is sort of a relative, and I've highlighted that, that with many of these, I suspect it may change. So certainly for patients um, um, on the regimen, the typical regimen for DMD, many of those um, probably would not be uh, as substantial of a risk. And now we don't know that for a fact. We know that driveline infection is an increasing problem for these patients. And we ex extrapolate uh, based on um, a small fraction of patients that are essentially a history of heart transplantation that are not candidates for redo heart transplant, but they maintain on some steroid regimen. And uh, those uh, small fraction of patients that have received destination therapy as a mode, certainly in our institution, their incidence of driveline infections is not substantially increased compared to those who are not on steroids. Um, recent history of malignancy is a, a potential consideration depending on the type of malignancy. The size, I think, as I said, is going to be a non-issue moving into the future. Whether or not the patient really needs an isolated left-sided support versus um, uh, support of the right side. Uh, morbid obesity is one thing we uh, do worry about. The, the literature does not necessarily contraindicate it, but um, frankly, the, the area we worry most about is patients are very malnourished because uh, their risk for infections is substantially increased. As you heard, anticoagulation is a key component of all these devices. And so if a patient's had a, history, a recent history of stroke, or they have other indications that they can't receive anticoagulation therapy currently, that would be one of the critical components of um, uh, not being potentially a candidate for receiving a device. Psychosocial challenge is not something we talk about as much, but in fact it does come into the conversation, and with these devices, particularly in the outpatient setting and the layer of um, complexity that the pediatric age group adds, and with that, the lack of assent, um, are, which means uh, whether the patient, uh, frankly, is wanting to undergo this procedure, can be another uh, critical component of the decision-making. So um, not to provide exhaustive list, these are some of the factors we think about when we're considering a patient to be a, a, a possible candidate for a device. And I'll stop there and be happy to take further questions at the end. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Agasadi. There are a few questions. I think we're going to try to get to the questions at the end of um, all the talks, if that's okay with the audience. So if Dr. McConnell um, could now present the pros and cons of living with a ventricular assist device. Dr. McConnell? Yes, uh, thank you and good afternoon. And uh, my colleagues have uh, perfectly 
uh, set up the discussion in the right way and giving you a nice primer as to uh, what a bat is and what some of the criteria are. And I'm charged with uh, trying to help you understand exactly uh, what it's like to live with the ventricular assist device and hopefully extrapolate a little bit uh, to the population of interest, and that's uh, folks with Duchenne's. I do um, do a fair bit of research and am supported with Thoratech. Most of the data I'm going to share with you as to quality of life and other data has been uh, taken from studies uh, using the HeartMate 2, and that's not because I necessarily think it's better, but clearly no device is proven to be uh, better than any other device when we're talking about these second generation devices, such as hardware or the HeartMate 2. And the most amount of data that we have for patients going forward has been from the HeartMate 2, and I think that just confining it to one device will give us kind of a clear indication of uh, the data. Um, I've sort of divided this up into the pros, and I sort of look at that as a symbiosis of man and machine. And then some of the cons are some of the aspects of uh, um, issues that stem from uh, man's rejection of the machine and then some of the issues of the machine itself, in this case the VAD, as they compete uh, against man. So it's kind of like a sci-fi uh, novel here. But anyway, as we uh, move on, and, and I think this has been uh, very well illustrated by my colleagues, that a VAD is, a, is effective in what it does, and that is uh, help support or take over the function, circulatory function of uh, the heart. And I think the other issue from living with the VAD, it's a very easy system to live with. You essentially have to make sure it has electricity. And as you saw the picture earlier of, um, of um, Vice President Cheney in the chair, he was demonstrating how easy it is to take a battery out, listen to the alarm, and know that you have to put the battery back in to make it operate and function correctly. With that, of course, there are some issues of power outages, cable fractures, other things that would interrupt your power. Most of these have all been uh, well worked out, and there are uh, systems in, in place that uh, help people through that. And uh, folks get very, very savvy with their batteries and their power supply as you uh, learn to live with this device. But the key is, is there's really nothing to do from a patient standpoint just to assure that the device has power. Um, <clears throat> the experience uh, with uh, NL that is that it's been proven to be very effective. This is at least one year old data looking at the number of patients supported beyond a year. We're right now, this says 7,000. We're probably right now around 11,000 implants of just the HeartMate 2. Um, but you can see that there are very few patients supported, and we have very little experience with patients supported over the long term, really beyond four years. Statistically, it's sort of an aberration. But in the figure, uh, I show that it's very effective at relieving the symptoms of heart failure uh, that Dr. Jake was so clearly uh, delineated um, and uh, quite rapidly after placement as the device takes over the function of the heart. Um, focusing specifically uh, towards Duchenne and what would be expected, we talked a lot about destination therapy. This figure here just shows a competing outcome. The two competing outcomes we care about is one being alive and the other one the opposite. And we can see that if you look at the most recent data from that article uh, previously referenced uh, from 2012 about the Intermax data, uh, all comers with destination therapy, 64% uh, of patients are alive at 24 months, and I think that that's uh, probably a reasonable expectation. There's nothing to support the fact that we'd have any better uh, treatment uh, or expectation in Duchenne's. Some things about that data, though, in the comparison of Duchenne's with the standard destination therapy patient, again, that's going to be the older patient that is not a transplant candidate. Those are the ones going on to destination therapy. Their comorbidities are such that, are, are such that they can't have transplant, but none of those destination therapy patients were ventilator dependent. That's a contraindication in almost every center. And all of those destination therapy patients uh, were probably ambulatory and none were uh, chronically in a wheelchair. 
On the positive side, we know the younger you are, it tends to decrease the complication risk, and I'm going to get into a few of those areas. And so in the destination therapy cohort, there are almost no patients that are as young as uh, boys with Duchenne's that we're talking about supporting here or potentially supporting today. And so that's something in the comorbidity column that they might have a benefit. When we look at improved quality of life, uh, we know in the destination therapy patient, which is the, the patient population uh, we're really most thinking about, uh, that quality of life is improved. Here's two uh, typical or uh, often used uh, measures of quality of life, the Minnesota uh, heart failure scale as well as the Kansas City cardiomyopathy. Um, measures, and you can see that once the ventricular assist device is placed, uh, you have a normalization or a return near normal of quality of life. Again, in the ambulatory patients, uh, getting back your uh, cardiac function or your heart function with the use of the ventricular assist device is quite effective. But we just don't have any data on pediatric quality of life, uh, and we certainly don't have any uh, information out there specific to uh, Duchenne. Um, I think the one area of quality of life, obviously we're not going to restore ambulation and other uh, or ambulatory capacity, but I think the one area, and I think we all that work in this area of heart failure have seen patients uh, where low energy, low stamina leads to mental frustration. People get ornery, they get cranky, they don't want to do things. Um, and they either get a heart transplant or they're uh, fitted or outfitted with a ventricular assist device, and their mood and their affect almost changes instantly. Um, and that's a very interesting thing because I think the brain is the one organ in Duchenne that is most likely to gain and likely gain the most benefit uh, from support. Uh, Dr. Jake was very eloquently uh, illustrated, and I think uh, perfectly illustrated, how lung function can be impacted by poor heart function, we uh, put that in a can called Starling Forces, um, and I think that will improve some lung function, but it's not going to affect uh, the use of the diaphragm, and as we heard, there's potentially one of the devices, the HeartMate 2, may even uh, decrease diaphragm function just by the way that the device is uh, placed, although there's really no strong data to support that uh, either. So getting a little bit to the uh, the man versus machine and machine versus man are some of the typical uh, cons of having uh, the device. As we talked about, anticoagulation is necessary secondary to the fact that the device has contact with the blood. The blood uh, responds to that in forming uh, um, clots. Uh, the typical blood thinner that's used or anticoagulant that's used is warfarin. It's really the workhorse in this uh, area and it requires a frequent monitoring and adjustment of levels. And um, you get to a point after a few uh, weeks to months where that stabilizes out, but there's always that ongoing uh, issue of needing to have uh, that anticoagulation drawn. And um, frequently uh, folks uh, report to us, uh, report back that that's one of the things that uh, impacts them the most is worrying about that blood thinner in the levels. The consequences of anticoagulation, and in particular the second generation devices such as the HeartMate 2 and the Heartware and the other continuous flow devices, is that we have bleeding events. And these events are somewhat related to the anticoagulation and some related to the device themselves. But uh, about 20% or one out of five patients after surgery will have to be re-explored secondary to bleeding. Um, and this is data from as recently as uh, 2012. Uh, the chance of receiving a blood transfusion after you've had one of these pumps placed is three out of four patients, 75% would. And that event rate is uh, if you have an LVAD in place in that first year, you should at least expect to have a blood transfusion. GI bleeding uh, is probably, in, there's just a publication uh, this past week in the Journal of American College of Cardiology, readmission rates after continuous LVAD uh, placement, and GI bleeding is the number one thing, and that is 
and this is late GI bleeding, GI in referring to the bowel, such as the stomach, the large intestine, and developing areas that, that lead to bleeding in the GI tract. And this is generally after about 60 days with the device in place, and somewhere between 15 to 20 percent of patients will experience that. And it doesn't lead to a high mortality or a death rate at only 1 percent, but it does lead to frequent readmission. And just as I reported from that recent paper in this past week, um, it's the most uh, common uh, cause for readmission. And then we have strokes, and that's really the dreaded thing uh, with these devices is we lead to, can lead to strokes. Hemorrhagic stroke in particular affects one out of every 20 patients outfitted with one of these devices. And if you look at an event rate or events per patient year um, in this small uh, group of patients, we would estimate that if you had the device for 30 years, you probably would expect to have at least one stroke during that period of time. Another area uh, that we've talked a lot about, or there's been talk about this biventricular support, support of both sides of the heart. When you only support the left side of the heart, you end up with, uh, in a certain number of cases, where the right heart is forced to keep up in the, these situations. And that can happen in 20% of patients. Most of the time, as my colleagues indicated, it can be handled with medications. Uh, but there's frequent readmissions, uh, uh, honestly, for uh, issues related to the unsupported side of the heart, the right side of the heart. And uh, there is something to consider in Duchenne uh, muscular dystrophy is, is that as the uh, disease progresses, it will continue to affect the right side. And though the work on the right side is less, than the left, we may find out later on that we've had progression of uh, in, in uh, deterioration in right heart function leading to a higher incident even than the 20% found in, in, in the destination therapy patients. Another area is uh, blood clot, in particular the actual clot, not the bleeding, but the clot, a true stroke, again, about an 8% risk of that, one out of 12 patients outfitted with one of these uh, more modern devices will experience a stroke. That combined uh, rate is one out of, uh, out of 12. Other neurologic events, events that we can't really define as a stroke, but what we call minor strokes or mini strokes, seizures, other episodes of confusion related uh, or events that happen while on the device. Some may be related, some may be completely unrelated, but that happens uh, one out of every five patients or one event every eight years if you had your pump that long. And then pump thrombus, or the pump actually clotting due to those blood clots, it happens in about uh, one out of every 20 patients, and then in about half of those patients, the pump would need to be uh, changed out. The other major uh, issue is infection, and I say major because it, it actually falls out as being the most often uh, um, complication that happens after most of the time it's minor. It can be treated with antibiotics, but that's of infections. This device is a very large foreign body. Even if it fits in the palm of your hand, it's still relatively a large foreign body. And we have many, many uh, sites in which bacteria live in our body and have access uh, in uh, it, foreign uh, substances within our body uh, can, can be uh, a site in which infection can take hold and our body can't effectively fight it. With that, about 30% of patients have an infection of some sort afterwards. Only a very, very few, less than 7%, would ever need to have their device exchanged. Infections at the drive line, where I show that sort of explosion on the patient's abdomen there, is about 27% of patients, or about one infection every four years related to the driveline, if you put it in those terms. And most of that starts with trauma at the driveline site. It either gets jerked on or is otherwise manipulated or unstabilized, and then an infection can happen. I think overall the, the point taken from this uh, is, is that an LVAD is extremely effective in what it's uh, designed for, and that's to relieve heart failure uh, symptoms. And it really rivals heart transplant uh, with these modern devices at one and two year survival. We just have so little data beyond that two years, it's very hard to talk about the durability and, and the survival beyond that. It improves quality of life without a doubt in ambulatory patients. 
that are not transplant candidates, the destination therapy. It does require anticoagulation, uh, which can be looked at as a con or a minor, and then there's these bleeding risks. Uh, about one out of every five patients will have some complication related to uh, bleeding of some sort. Um, there certainly is improved neurologic safety or risk of stroke and all that, but that risk is still right around one out of every ten patients will experience a stroke. And infection is a common issue with about 30% of patients at some level having an infection. And then um, I think finally the issue is there's very many, there's a bunch of unknowns uh, regarding this therapy for uh, boys uh, with Duchenne's. Um, and we just don't know uh, for sure what survival and quality of life and those sorts of things. And I think that um, there are many comorbidities that uh, boys with Duchenne's have that have traditionally been viewed as absolute contraindications against bad placement. And so it's really whether these unknowns should be really seen as uh, potential hope or should be generating some anxiety. And with that, I'll uh, turn it over to the next presenter. Thank you, Dr. McConnell. And Dr. Morales, um, if you could tell us what's been learned from the first Duchenne patients who have received that. I'm sorry, the question was? Oh, I'm sorry. You're, I was just introducing your section. Um, oh, okay. <laughs> uh, uh, well, I want to thank the Parent Project uh, for giving us the opportunity to talk uh, and share some of our thoughts on Duchenne's patients and VADs. Um, I, I think the... This data here, many people uh, listening are probably already know, uh, but it's important to review that anywhere from maybe 50 to 80 percent of children, really young adults uh, and adolescents with Duchenne's will die of heart failure. And they have stabilized in terms of their pulmonary symptoms and are at home, uh, but because they're considered not to be transplant candidates, uh, they know their natural history, which for many of them is to die with heart failure. So I, I I first started uh, thinking about Duchenne's and, and VADs uh, because we had children uh, coming in and out of the ICU who had Duchenne's and would be admitted to the cardiac ICU with heart failure, and uh, they would be treated and then sent home and they would come back again. And uh, actually, uh, the first person to actually ever place a VAD in uh, someone with Duchenne's was a friend of mine called Antonio Amadeo, who's actually, uh, there's a children's hospital in the Vatican Hospital, I mean in the Vatican. And we had actually talked about this uh, a couple of times, thinking about uh, if you could put a device in, uh, especially with these second and third generation devices where people have lived um, really three, four, or five years with it, could it change their natural history? Um, and being able to be sent home and extending their life. So uh, Antonio went ahead and actually did the first two ever, and I was charged with talking about those two patients. So his first case was a 15-year-old uh, Duchenne's patient who had repeated emissions for heart failure. So much like I was talking about, we see these kids who would uh, come in and be admitted with heart failure. They would get some type of therapy, get better, and then be discharged home. Uh, but in this case, uh, he went ahead and um, planted the Jarvik 2000 LVAD, uh, extubated in 24 hours. And very interestingly, all three cases, of the only three cases I think done in Duchenne's patients, all of the patients were extubated within the first 24 hours. Um, and despite the need for re-exploration uh, and a long uh, kind of respiratory treatment after the need for re-exploration, he eventually got better and was discharged uh, home. Now, I'm going to go back to the first slide because we haven't, this is the Jarvik device uh, on the right there. And as you see, instead of the drive line actually coming out in the abdomen, which is what attaches to the battery, it actually um, is tunneled up and comes out, uh, goes under the skin and then comes out behind the ear. And uh, Antonio felt that that was a better device and, uh, and a better drive line area. Um, because of uh, sometimes the body habitus of, of young adults with Duchenne's in terms of scoliosis, but also in terms of lifting the patient. Uh, often they have to be lifted from the mid-abdomen and chest, and not having a drive line there it was thought to be uh, perhaps better. Now, 
one of the things that they did learn is uh, actually that what we call a pedestal, which is this um, drive line that comes out behind the ear, actually got infected in this uh, first child because he kept sleeping on on that side. And so it actually had to be revised. And he came in again because uh, it had been infected. It was revised, and then he was uh, discharged two months later. And now is two years post-implant and is doing fine at home. The next case that Antonio did was a 14-year-old boy, and this patient is interesting. Probably would have been a diff, uh, probably not the optimal patient to choose in terms of uh, how he presented. So he had multiple emissions for heart failure and uh, poor respiratory function, but actually had a cardiac arrest and was on ECMO. Uh, and as we know, just in general, regardless of the etiology, once you're on ECMO transferring to a VAD, those patients tend to do worse in general. Um, but on ECMO, he actually recovered some of his right-sided function, so his left-sided function uh, still was poor, but on the right side, it uh, started working better. So he was able to come off the ECMO machine, and uh, the ECMO machine not only supports the right and left heart, but also supports the lungs. And so, again, uh, which I find pretty incredible, he was extubated in 24 hours after surgery. Unfortunately, he developed some fluid around the left lung, uh, at which time they placed a drain to try to take some of that fluid off. And there was a spleen injury. Now, this brings up one of the other points that I will talk about later. Children with Duchenne's actually have very, uh, their diaphragms are very thin and they're very high, uh, which is why I think when they put the chest tube in, uh, they injured the spleen because the spleen is much higher uh, on the rib cage uh, than would be in a normal child or person. Um, and so with that spleen injury, uh, that caused some persistent bleeding and some issues, uh, which eventually resol resolved. The interesting point is they took the patient off heparin, which is, as Jake was talking about, a medicine that helps thin the blood so there's not clotting in the device, and they took him off that medicine for over a month. Uh, and despite that, uh, there were no embolic events or no um, clots formed in the device. Unfortunately, oh, well, so then he required a tracheostomy for ventilator support, uh, was discharged home, uh, but unfortunately had to, 16 months after post-implant, so had been home for almost a year, uh, went to an outside hospital uh, to get a bronchoscopy, which is when they put a camera down into the breathing uh, or the windpipe uh, to take to take a look at the inside of the airways. And while doing that, they caused some bleeding. It's unclear to me whether they had taken him, him off his uh, blood thinning medicine, but unfortunately that bleeding uh, led to his death. And one of the lessons learned, I think, from that was that if you're going to do an invasive procedure you prob with someone uh, with this device, you probably should come back to the primary hospital and not do that at a hospital that's not as familiar with devices. So now I'm going to go on and talk about our patient. So like I had mentioned, I had been thinking for quite a while about trying to place a device in a patient with Duchenne's. And uh, the issue is it's not placing the device because technically, although I learned later that there are some technical differences, um, really it's the care of the patient before and after the device placement that needs to be uh that really needs to be thought about. And so when I uh, moved to Cincinnati, Cincinnati has one of the largest Duchenne's clinic and probably the largest cardiomyopathy program uh, for Duchenne's patients. And having uh, and being surrounded by experts in cardiology, neurology, uh, and pulmonology who specialize only in Duchenne's patients, I felt more comfortable uh, moving forward uh, with placing a device. Now, who did we decide to place that device in? Well, we thought we should place the device in someone who clearly uh, would, if not having Duchenne's, would clearly be a candidate for a device. So someone in chronic heart failure and on inotropic, who's inotropic dependent uh, with decreasing cardiac function despite being on an inotrope. And as we know, heart failure symptoms are plus or minus in some of the Duchenne's uh, adolescents and young adults depending on where they are in their, in their disease. 
they would have no significant end organ dysfunction and have a stable pulmonary function. Uh, that doesn't mean they're not on a SIP vent or other positive pressure ventilation, but at least that they're stable for the time. And we thought this again because these are non, uh, so for non Duchenne's patients, there are very few adults who are actually sent home on an inotrope and are on inotropes chronically at home. Most of those would go forward with either a heart transplant or some type of device. And so we felt that this was uh, a clear indication for for a patient to get a device. Now, our hope is as we gain and other people um, use this device or use VADs in, in patients with Duchenne's and gain more experience and confidence, really, in that we're going to obtain uh, excellent results that we'll probably start placing the VAD earlier. And we're all very interested to know, you know, how that will affect their functionality uh, in regards to uh, their symptoms. And so uh, that is our hope, but we had not done that yet. So all of these people listed here are, are people who I think are essential to have involved uh, when we're looking at a candidate. And actually this this boy that you see here is the first case presented, uh, um, the, uh, the 15-year-old that was done in uh, Italy. And this is actually during the time when he came back because his drive line got infected, his pedestal. And uh, I had a chance to uh, talk uh, with him and, and visit him. So, again, uh, these are all the people that I think are essential to be involved when uh, looking at uh, a Duchenne's patient who might be a candidate. So another, and again, when evaluating for a candidate, these are all the different evaluations that I think need to occur, and I won't necessarily go through all of them, but especially depending on the body habitus and what you plan to use, and especially because uh, some of these um, young adults or adolescents are actually smaller, uh, deciding what device and if they would fit is very important, and so we're fortunate for actually all or most of our devices that are intracorporeal that we place here. We do a 3D reconstruction of the chest and the heart, and then we actually can do virtual surgery, which which basically means we can tell where we want to put the device and if it's going to fit, and uh, I think that's important, uh, especially if there's going to be scoliosis. So one thing we learned is about swallowing so even though that many Duchenne's patients uh, are eating and, and not feeling that they're aspirating, in fact, we found out that many actually are aspirating and understanding that before they go to surgery is probably important. And then all these things that you see here in terms of social work evaluation, psychology, um, oh, someone's uh, changing the slides. That isn't me, but okay, I will go back. Is someone changing the slides? Okay. Um, and one very important thing that's listed here on the bottom is the evaluation of the breathing equipment that they use at the home. And not only just that they use a SIP vent, but the very specific type and brand. And we'll talk about that a little bit later. But I think uh, even though you can have... Uh, a type of SIP vent here in your hospital, if it's not one that they're used to, it actually uh, can cause them issues and, and it affects them. So once we have a full evaluation, have really gone through all of these, we, pres we have an ethics board consultation. Uh, we then, uh, they were presented at our VAD heart failure selection committee, which we have, and then at our Heart Institute case management conference, which is a conference we have where all surgical cases are presented. Uh, next, the consent process. Uh, so very important is to educate the parents and to sit down with them a couple times. Again, we are not doing this as a uh, as a salvage therapy in terms of that they're so sick that we have to do it immediately. This should be an elective and well thought out process. And so um, sitting down with the parents a few times and talking to them about what they can expect is uh, very important and also what they expect to get out of this. And we should also talk about the fact that the Duchenne's um, 
that they will continue to progress in terms of their uh, Duchenne's muscular dystrophy. So the need for a trach or G-tube in the future, if they don't already have one, is a possibility. Uh, we also have our nurses and VAD coordinators speak with them actually separate than the surgeon because often they get into different discussions than the parents do with the surgeons. And actually, uh, our VAD coordinators and nurses actually talk to them uh, much more than I do when we're starting to evaluate them. Uh, and then obviously giving them information about the particular device, but also to clearly lay out the additional care and precautions they'll need at home uh, once discharged is very important. But when they are, if they are ready and, and want to move forward, obviously they go through a consent process. And so now I'm going to talk about uh, our our gentleman, he was a 29-year-old uh, male who had Duchenne's diagnosed at age 7. He was wheelchair, wheelchair bound by age 11. He worked for a while as a 9-11 dispatcher and, and eventually got uh, tired. He was chronically on a SIP vent and CPAP at night. Now, he had been on Milrinone for five years uh, with decreasing heart function despite the Milrinone at home. And clearly this is not the... This is not the care that a patient without Duchenne's uh, would be getting. This patient who is an adult would, would have either gone to transplant or had some type of ventricular assist device. So we thought this was a clear indication uh, in terms of his heart that he required a VAD or that he could be offered a VAD, I should say. And so we chose the HeartMate 2. Uh, we chose this because it's obviously FDA approved and also is probably the the ventricular assist device that has been used the most and the most is known about, especially in terms of destination. So uh, he, he did quite well during the surgery, uh, had minimal transfusions, and it was actually extubated in 16 hours. Unfortunately, on day three, there was a concern that the device had a thrombus in it uh, because of, of its functioning, and so we actually returned to the OR and exchanged that device. Uh, and the second time, it took him longer to be extubated. To, uh, it took him actually several weeks. Uh, although we tried one more time, it, it did take having to go back the second time, I think, uh, took the wind out of his sails, and it took us longer to get him extubated. Now, one thing that we learned uh, is that, and while I was operating, you could see that patients with Duchenne's have their fascia is, uh, or their tissue planes are very soft, and the amount of abdominal muscle obviously is minimal. So their ability to 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 heal the pocket or the area around where the device is is not great. And when the body can't heal something, it starts to create serous fluid, which is just tissue fluid. And it wasn't necessarily infected, but that continued to be a problem for for quite some time. Uh, so that's one thing to put in the back of our minds that devices that require their own pocket, uh, and when I mean pocket is, uh, and is that the device itself has to sit, uh, you have to dissect out a tissue plane and have the device sit in that tissue plane. Uh, eventually he was discharged home in two months and now is doing well and seeing us in clinic. The next pictures are us putting the device in and that's our patient on the right. So lessons learned, uh, communication. So although we had thought about this and had three or four interdisciplinary meetings about our first patient, um, getting the ICU and floor staff, meaning the nurses, respiratory therapists, uh, although they had representation there, they themselves uh, were only somewhat educated in what we were going to do. And I think communicating with them better uh, is something that we'll do uh, on our second patient who is happening uh, in the next month. Uh, this next uh, thing I think is really important. Ask the family and the patient to write a summary of their life, uh, what their expectations are from the VAD, and why the patient wants to go ahead with this. I think this is very important. It's very important for the staff uh, in the ICU as well as the floor, but it's also very important uh, for the family so that when things uh, aren't necessarily going as smooth or it's taking a little bit longer or they feel frustrated, they can look back at this and, and realize what their expectations and why they went ahead and did this. Uh, 
So other things uh, for programs who are thinking about doing this, having a robust and well-trained respiratory unit, but a respiratory therapist who is going to be the champion for this and understanding, again, not only that they use nasal pillows or a sip vent, but exactly what they use. So if you can imagine if a patient is breathing out of the same type of sip vent for years, any subtle changes in that, I think, uh it can be a, quite a big change for them. And so understanding that and understanding if that equipment can actually be brought into your hospital, those specific uh, devices, is important. Uh, additional staff. So the first couple, and again, uh, our patient really uh, had no movement, so was unable to feed themselves uh, and things like that. And so having more than just one nurse, perhaps for the first few days, is very important uh, during the immediate post-op period. And again, uh, in terms of staffing, just making sure that there are different nurses that rotate in and off in their care, if it's going to be somewhat extended, is important. Extubation. I won't go through all of these, but uh, I think trying to extubate as soon as possible, uh, having a cough assist, depending on where your patient is in their Duchenne's and their pulmonary function, uh, can be very important, and other other things that are listed there. So uh, practical things, a really large room, and not just an average large room, but uh, depending on if they have wheelchairs, lifts, VAT equipment, and other things, it's very important uh, to consider that. Uh, and, you know, a lot of these patients will be done in pediatric hospitals, and having uh, specific adult beds that convert to chairs or, even, you know, uh, can do respiratory therapy themselves uh, will be important. Uh, and I think we've talked enough about the equipment and just being clear that you can bring that equipment in and that the equipment exactly matches. In terms of the technical points, uh, again, we talked about the pocket, and so your choice of device, the, the next device that we're going to use is the Jarvik, which is the device that uh, was used by Antonio Medeo in Italy. And again, for two reasons. One, it doesn't have a pocket, uh, which the hardware also does not, which is the third device uh, from the left. But the other reason is where the drive line comes out and our ability to keep anything out of the abdomen so that when lifting the patient or shifting the patient, uh, it is not in your way. Um, something uh, that's very important in terms of placement is that the diaphragms are extremely high and that patients, especially if they've had scoliosis surgery, are are barrel chested. So where the where you would usually Put your device in your pocket is actually in a different plane than where the apex of the heart is. And so, again, another reason probably not to use a device where you have to have uh, the device have its own area or pocket. And then the drive line site, uh, which we've talked about a few times, is, is an important uh, aspect when choosing a device. Uh, something that uh, I think we all know but needs to be emphasized is you know, many of these young adults uh, and their families have created a system that really works well. So for example, our patient had a PICC line in for five years and never had an infection. So that's probably much better than a hospital and had never had a bed sore. And so the family really knows what works for them. And so it's very important that we listen to the family and even though that we think it doesn't make sense uh, often it will probably work best for that patient because they've had years of taking care of that patient and understand that. And so understanding that and having the parents around, especially in the beginning until a system is set up or a schedule is set up is extremely important, I think. Um, other other things, you know, when the patient has CPAP or establishing a plan of how to communicate if they remain intubated more than a day, and also uh, when they have a mask, how, how should they communicate, and kind of thinking of that ahead of time. Uh, especially because unlike other patients who are intubated, they might not be able to write. Uh, and so that's our usual mean of communication on patients who are intubated, which might not work here. 
uh, things that might be known, but it's just exaggeration of responses to certain sedations uh, we need to keep in mind, as well as uh, although we had had OT and PT involved from the beginning, uh, I think we learned a lot in clearly having a set schedule right from the beginning of stretching and massaging and things will, is, I think, important to their recovery. So Duchenne's patients uh, often can die of arrhythmias as a result of their heart failure, and the question if you need an uh, ICD should be explored. Uh, that is being done a lot in the adult world now, not non-Duchenne's, but uh, people who have that still are requiring an ICD. And then uh, just remember when you're discharging them and, and you're giving the education that depending, again, where the patient is, they might not be able to change their batteries or do things. And so keeping that consideration and really training more than one or two caregivers uh, might be required. Uh, I think this point is really imp uh, important. So you're taking uh, someone who uh, was in a pretty stable state and may or may not have had symptoms, but again, many of the Duchenne's patients don't have a ton of symptoms because they're already non-ambulatory and some of them uh, are already on a SIP vent and maybe are not feeding themselves. And so you're taking someone from a stable state and then putting them through a big surgery and they're coming out uh, out of that surgery and being discharged home. And we don't have the expectation that all of a sudden they're going to feed themselves or do that. Again, the, the purpose or the primary goal for this is to change their natural history. It's to try to prevent them, uh, again, from our best estimation, our patient probably, we thought, had less than a year to live. So what we're hoping is to give him three, four, five years uh, of of life uh, in his present state. And if he happens uh, to feel better, in that new state, then that would be great. But that isn't necessarily the primary goal. Now, that might change as we start to implant these devices sooner in this patient population. Uh, and then nutrition uh, is obviously key. And, you know, needing uh, G-tube and ensuring that uh, they're not actually aspirating is uh, important. Uh, again, I, I already started touching on this, just making uh, sure that the family understands Pre before that, you know, this is not necessarily to, it might make them feel better, but that at this point and in this patient that we picked, it was really to extend their life. Uh, and the fact that the Duchenne's uh, will con or muscular dystrophy will continue to progress per, um, and the need for a trach or G-tube if they don't already have one is definitely possible. Uh, we've again. This is kind of what I was talking about. That the main purpose is living a, is taking someone living a full life and helping them extend that life. Uh, if they have a secondary benefit of in improving their symptoms that they do have, then that would be uh, obviously an added bonus. And again, as we implant earlier, we'll probably see this change. Uh, we want to thank our first patient, which you see here on the right. Uh, for being a pioneer. I think it took him a lot of courage to decide to go ahead because we were very honest with him that there was, this is the first time it's been done in North America. It's only been done twice before in Italy and that we were going to be doing a lot of learning with him. Uh, but, uh, he, he was, he was very, uh, he really wanted to be a pioneer for this, and he actually has someone he's related to who has this, who's younger, and feels that, you know, he was opening a door uh, for a lot of these patients. Um, and I do feel that there is the potential to change the natural history of many of these boys and men with Duchenne's, uh, and our ability to do this will continue to improve as uh, technology, as devices get smaller. There are technologies now that are being developed where there's not even a drive line that goes through the skin, so that would obviously uh, help this population tremendously. As we gain more experience, as other centers uh, start doing this and we come together and talk about the lessons that we learned, we'll continue to improve and our expectations for good results will continue uh, to increase. And again, at the end of the day, you know, patients have to want to move forward with this uh, and be brave enough to do that. Thank you very much.
Thank you, Dr. Morales. There have been several questions online regarding the um, size of the patient, the age of the patient. Um, I would assume that the size of the patient would limit only the size of the device that uh, would be implanted and wouldn't necessarily determine whether or not the, the device could be implanted. Uh, Dr. Morales, could you speak to that? So again, you know, these devices, as they get smaller, we can use them in smaller patients. I have, so the hardware I've used in a nine-year-old, uh, and so patients can actually be pretty, pretty young and get these second-generation devices. Now, there are devices uh, that can be used in infants that everyone on the phone has probably used, but these are not devices, uh, these are first-generation devices, and they're not for destination. So there is there is some minimal size, but I would imagine that most patients with Duchenne's with significant heart failure would be above the size or would be candidates for the devices we now have available. Okay. And one way to guarantee that is, again, this this virtual surgery in which we can do 3D reconstruct. We get a CAT scan of the chest and of the device, and then we put the two together and can see whether it's going to fit or not. Thank you. Dr. McConnell, many of the um, signs and symptoms that would constitute new, the New York heart failure status don't really apply to Duchenne patients. Uh, shortness of breath, decreased ability to exercise. So what constitutes heart failure? What specific symptoms of heart failure do you look at, look to in a Duchenne patient in order to consider whether or not a bad may or may not be appropriate? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question, and I think uh, even David's uh, Dr. Morales' talk, uh, you know, focused on that in a couple different points that it, it can be very hard symptom-wise. Uh, we rely, uh, as it sounds like Dr. Morales did in his patient, on uh, the echocardiogram and other uh, end organ function really comes into play. Um, and then, you know, a trial of uh, some medications can tell you, such as melrinone, uh the patient uh, he reported on was on a much longer term of melrinone, but a short course of melrinone to resolve something like uh, kidney dysfunction if the, if the boy is experiencing that um, is, is uh, one issue. But we, we are limited in symptoms, which is the primary driver. It's really the only thing that the FDA cares about and other things like that. And, and so you have to look at those, uh, you have to rely more on the objective finding rather than the subjective finding. And right now I would say the mainstay of our objective, uh, criteria centers around, uh, heart function and the echocardiogram. Uh, so that would be a, a primary uh, issue. And then you have to get in a little bit deeper. Renal function is very hard to assess. Also, in, in uh, boys with Duchenne's uh, secondary, they decrease muscle mass. Uh, so you have to be a little more sophisticated there. Um, and those are some of, the, some of the areas. But a short trial on ionotropy or on those medications, and if you physically feel better, that would be an indication uh, that an LVAD, which is far more robust and effective than a drug, uh, would potentially help a boy. Thank you. Dr. Agassati, what's the average life of a van of a VAD? Well, um, it, it depends. <laughs> I think every time I say this, it depends. In terms of the long-term mechanical surgery support devices, the Heartware and HeartMate 2 that we spend most time talking about, there are patients out there that have had the device. There's not a lot of them, but there are definitely patients out there that have had the device, same device um, for five to seven years out. And when that device fails or is finished, then is there reimplantation of a, an additional or another device? Well, at, at this point, what I was saying, these are patients that are ongoing, uh, that have been supported. Um, in terms of, in fact, failure of the device, uh, there have been, um, in the HeartMate 2, the original version, there were some patients that had device failure within even the first two years, but the, the modifications were made and that devices worked uh, very well. And with the hardware trial, there was only one device failure early on within that first one-year period. Um, and so it's the, 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 men, the, the years that I mentioned, it wasn't like these are the patients, these are ongoing patients that are currently being supported with those devices. So 
what the actual longevity is, I don't know. And I would say, um, you know, one could potentially extrapolate 10 years. I, I, I don't know if I could say for certain. I, I don't know if any of my other colleagues would have information that uh, could answer that question in terms of longevity of these devices long term. Does anybody have anything to add? As Jake was, I'd be pretty optimistic that these devices are essentially permanent devices. They don't have valves in them, the ones that we're talking about. As uh, several of uh, my colleagues have mentioned, these are a, a second, third generation devices where the, there is not a, a valve that's opening and closing. And they're basically fancy rotors that are spinning at high rates of speed, and the wear on the rotors themselves uh, should be negligible. So uh, barring some patient change, the devices themselves should be permanent. Thanks. And now it's one for one last question. Um, uh, Dr. Morales, what would be the benefit of earlier placement of a VAD in a uh, patient with Duchenne as opposed to waiting until they were in late in heart failure, late stage heart failure? Well, I didn't mean necessarily uh, earlier in their heart failure. I meant earlier in their – so obviously our first patient, you know, uh, was at a point in his Duchenne's that he was chronically on the sit vent and was unable to feed himself or move or anything like that. I think if if we do it earlier, uh, the ability, and again, I wouldn't say reverse any of the lungs, but, you know, as Dr. Jaquis said, you know, having bad heart failure does not help your breathing. So, you know, how it would help their breathing when they're not so end stage, uh, no one knows. Right, and also, right. you know, the fatigue they're getting when they're feeding themselves, or if if they're on their wheelchair that they're moving themselves, you know, how the VAD is going to help that, and what percentage of that is heart failure, as opposed to their Duchenne's, nobody knows, right? And Antonio actually said that, you know, one of the kids or one of the adolescents got significantly better in terms of his activity significantly better. Uh, and so, you know, he went from, and again, I, I hesitate to say this because I, I don't know this to be true, but he was, he had just started going to uh, using wheelchair all the time, and then he kind of went back to using uh, crutches and braces. But again, I don't think that's a reversal of the Duchenne's, obviously. Uh, but the component of heart failure that that plays into their weakness, I don't think anybody knows. So that's what I mean by increasing their functionality, perhaps. Thank you very much. Um, we are at 90 minutes, so I think we should probably wrap this up. This has been a fascinating discussion. Um, obviously, this may be an appropriate novel therapy that might change the course of this disease, and it's not without risks and requiring um, con serious consideration. And I truly appreciate all of your time and your expertise, and um, I know that the audience does as well. Thank you very much. This concludes this webinar. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.